53. This is called the Isaiah 53 Levitical Mysteries, and this is part one. First of all, let's begin verse one. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him or appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. But we ourselves esteemed him stricken, struck of God and afflicted. There's a word in Hebrew that means to carry or lift up. And the word is NASA. Try it. It's pretty much like NASA, you know, but NASA. And it appears in the book of Leviticus. And it's about carrying, particularly carrying sin. Leviticus 5.17 says, if a soul sins and commits any of these things which are forbidden, he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. And it speaks of one who bears, in Leviticus 19.8, one who bears his iniquities or profaning the holy things. He will be cut off. It goes on, it speaks of one who bears sins. Now before I get into this, Isaiah 53, we say that Isaiah 53 is about Messiah that it's clearly about Messiah. The ancient rabbis, they said that it was as well, but the modern rabbis will not. They'll say this is not about Messiah at all. And one of the things they'll say is that it cannot be that a man dies for sin. It cannot be, has nothing to do with Judaism. And what we say is, it has everything to do with the Jewish faith. The whole biblical faith is all about sacrifices leading up to something. And so if Isaiah 53 is the real thing, it is what we say it is, then there should be a link between Isaiah 53 and the ancient scroll of the priests that we call Leviticus. Because that was all about the sacrifices of Israel. So if Messiah is the sacrifice... And, the, and that which Isaiah 53 is talking about, we should see a link between Isaiah 53 and the book of Leviticus. And that is what we're going to open up tonight. And I want you to focus. There's some deep things here. And we're beginning with this concept of Nasa. It's throughout Leviticus. It talks about carrying sin. But in Isaiah 53, you see the same concept, it comes up again and again, or at least well, several times, and that is, it is of one person bearing, carrying things. That's the picture. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him as struck by God. And again it says in verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Some of your Bibles say bear, some say carry, some can even say take up. And so it's, it's saying he will bear their iniquities. And the word in Hebrew for iniquities there is avon. Try it, avon. Avon is the same word that appears throughout Leviticus when it talks about carrying sin. But it gets even, you know, more exact. In Isaiah 53, verse 12, I will give him a portion with a grape. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out his life to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Now, the word when it says he himself bore the sin of many, the word in he Hebrew there is the word nasa. The same word that appears throughout Leviticus. In fact, if you remember on Yom Kippur, when they lay the sins of the people on the scapegoat, it says the scapegoat shall take up or carry those sins away. The word is nasa. The same exact Hebrew word used of the sacrifice is now used of a man in Isaiah 53. And what's he doing? He's not just carrying something. He's carrying sin upon him. 
So the pictures you find in Leviticus when it says this one will carry upon the sin or even talks about the soul carrying its own sin is again and again in the picture of Isaiah 53. It reappears. He's the one who carries sin. He carries sorrow. He carries disease. He carries iniquity. He carries all these things. He bears it. And the, the, one of the differences about what you find the use of these words in Leviticus and Isaiah 53 is that he's not bearing his own iniquity. See, in Leviticus, it, t- it talks about bearing your own iniquity. He's bearing someone else's iniquity. This is the only thing you'll see about a man bearing another's iniquity in the Bible. And then he's not also bearing the iniquity of one life. He's bearing the iniquity of many lives. It says, he bore our, he carries our he took up our sins, our, our infirmities. And what does this reveal? The person in Leviticus who is guilty of sin, it says he bears his own iniquity. And he bore his iniquity, it says, because, again and again, it says he profaned what was holy. When it talks about the person who is bearing their iniquity, the person was guilty of profaning the holy. He was cursed of God. He was unclean. So what's it saying here? Messiah in bearing our iniquities and our sin, he becomes treated as if someone, someone who had profaned God, who was a blasphemer. What, what did they accuse him of? Being a blasphemer. He was treated as one who in Leviticus, that's the one, they're unclean, they have profaned the holy, they are bearing the sin. The priests are the ones who, who would declare this one is guilty and this one is unclean. And so the priests of Israel are the ones who came to Messiah and judged him guilty even though he's innocent because it's not his own sin. But whoever bears the sin becomes as one who has profaned God. And what else happens in Leviticus when it talks about the soul that shall bear its own sin or the one who's guilty? It says that one shall be cut off from his people. Some of them would be cut off out of the camp. They'd be outside or some until they were clean or some just cut off. So Messiah is now that person. It's the same language, except he's not guilty. He's taken it for us. But so what's going to happen to Messiah? He's going to be cut off. He's going to be cut off from his people. That's the mystery here. Messiah was cut off from his own people. He literally, you know, the people in Leviticus, if they're unclean, are sent outside the camp. Messiah, it says, was sent outside the gates. He suffered outside the gates of Jerusalem. That's outside the camp. Cut off from his own people. His life would be cut off. In Isaiah 53, verse 8, it says this. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away and as for his generation. Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? He was cut off out of the land. Leviticus says that the soul that sins will be cut off. Well, he's cut off from the land. And notice another fulfillment of this with Messiah. When the, there was sin on someone or uncleanness, they'd be cut off from the people. Messiah, who dies for our sin, who takes on our sin, what happens to him? He's cut off from his own people for 2,000 years. He's separated from the Jewish people. That's part of it. He's treated as if he were a blasphemer. He's treated as if, you know, if you look at some of the, the rabbinic writings, there's, you know, there's good stuff in there and there's bad stuff in there. But it, it, some of them talk about him as if he was a blasphemer, as if he was doing witchcraft. As if, it's a, and some of them called him, instead of saying Yeshua, they called him Yeshu, which is different. They said Yeshu because it was an anagram of may his name be cut off. Cut off. May he be blotted out. And that's exactly what's happened. That's part of the mystery too. The one who has the sin upon them is cut off from the people. So that's why Messiah for 2,000 years has been cut off from his people. Not because he had any sin, but because he bore the sin of his people. It's amazing. And it's amazing too because the Jewish people have had, the rabbis have had other messiahs in their own mind, false messiahs, and yet they haven't been cut off. The one was called Shabbat Zevi, one of the biggest false messiahs. And he was in the year around 1666, and he rose up. He said he's the messiah, and that people started following him all over. Rabbis hailed him. He, he, this wave of hysteria swept through Europe and the Middle East. He claimed to be messiah, but then he started acting weird. He, he had a ceremony where he married a Torah scroll, and he started doing strange things. 
But then what happened is the Sultan of Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, said, you know, we don't like this. We're going to arrest him. They arrested him. And they said, you know, you have a choice. Either we kill you or you convert to Islam. So he converted to Islam. And you know what his followers did? They said, you know what that was? He was taking the sins upon himself. He was fulfilling Isaiah 53 as becoming a sinner. But he was a sinner. And some of them still followed him for a long time. And, and there are people who are, false, who are still not cut off from Israel. You know, they're still even hailed. There's another one, Bar Kokhba was hailed as a Messiah. And he's hailed to this day as a hero. And they're not cut off. But you know, Yeshua is cut off more than anyone. You know, you can be Jewish and you can believe, you can be an atheist, Jewish, you're still Jewish. You can be, you can be into Eastern, Eastern gods and reincarnation, paganism, Jewish. Fine, no problem with that. Believe in a Jewish rabbi born in a Jewish town to a Jewish mother, fulfilling the Jewish prophets named with a Jewish name, and suddenly you're not Jewish. This must be a, such a powerful man who can make a Jewish person not Jewish. He must be the Messiah. But what it's saying is, here's part of the mystery. That's why there's this big cut off. Because whoever takes upon the sin, whoever becomes sin, is cut off from his people. Yeshua is the the one of Isaiah 53. It's so awesome. And that's just in that one word about, about the one who bears the sin. Now let's go back. Leviticus. Back Actually, let's go back one step before Leviticus. It all flows together. Exodus 12. It says, you shall Passover, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood of the lamb in the basins, and you will strike the lintel and the two side posts of the door with the blood that's in the basin. And none of you will go out the door of the house until morning. Of course, this is Passover. God tells them, and this, this sacrifice is the sacrifice really behind all the sacrifices. And this is the Lamb of God, and this is where they put the, you know, they put the, the, the blood each way. And you can see in that, in a sense, you can see a cross. You can even see a, we, a star. We can do a whole thing with that. But it's the blood of the Lamb. And they're identifying with the Lamb of Passover. And Israel is saved on Passover by the blood of the Lamb on beams of wood. And over a thousand years later, it will all be fulfilled on another Passover when salvation comes. And when God puts the blood of the Lamb on another beam of wood, the cross, and it matches it all on the same day, same way, this is a Passover faith. Now, there is something about this putting the blood on the doorpost. There's a word that's used in the original, that in Hebrew, the word of how they put the blood of the Lamb on the beams of wood on Passover. The word is not God. Try it. It literally means to strike. You will strike the doorpost with the blood of the Lamb. And so the blood comes on there and that's salvation. But the thing is, that same word appears in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, I'll show you where. This is the word for that first national sacrifice. Surely our griefs he himself bore, verse 4, and our sorrows he carried... Yet we ourselves esteemed him as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The word for stricken is naga. The same word used of the Passover lamb, of taking the blood of the lamb and putting it on the beams of wood. So Messiah was struck by God. He was struck by God. And as he was struck, the blood of the lamb was put on the beams of wood. Passover. On Passover. And that's just Isaiah 53. I mean, it's amazing what's in there. Now a revelation from Leviticus. An interesting Hebrew word. The word is halal. Try it. It almost sounds like a happy word. It sounds like another word like halal, but that's very different. Halal is translated as to profane, to desecrate. It's translated in the Bible, profane, 18 times. And 13 of those 18 times are found in the book of Leviticus. Let me show you. Leviticus 18.21. You profane the name of your God. That's halal. Leviticus 19.12. Profane halal the name of your God. Again. Leviticus 20 verse 3. To defile, to halal my sanctuary, profane my holy name, rather. Interesting, it's, it's the same word, halal. That same word appears in Isaiah 53. And it's in a verse there... 
This is the verse it's in. He was wounded for our transgressions. When it says he was wounded, that's halal. The same word in Leviticus that speaks of profaning the name of God. Amazing, you could translate this as he was profaned. He was wounded, yeah, but he, you could translate it, he was profaned for our transgressions. Wow. A revelation into what happened. He is the Word of God, and he was profaned. You can only profane that which is holy. He is holy. He's the Holy One of Israel. In Leviticus 19.18, it says, Because he has profaned the holy thing of the Lord, well, he is the Holy One of the Lord. So the word is used of profaning the Word of God. Messiah is himself. He's wounded. It means that too in here. But Messiah is also profaned. He's desecrated. He's stripped. He's mocked. He's denigrated. He's treated as unholy. He's treated as vile, as stripped, naked, hung on a cross. He's profaned for our transgressions. That's what sin does to God. Leviticus is filled with a word, avon, try it. Avon is the word for iniquity. And sacrifices always had to do, or often had to do, you hear that, the words together, iniquity, avon. And so many of these things speak of, with sacrifice, speak of the word avon, iniquity. And that's also where it says the soul shall bear iniquity. Avon, avon. Leviticus, all over. You'll also find the same word, avon, in Isaiah 53. It is Messiah. He's the ultimate sacrifice. He's the ultimate, so he bears the avon, the iniquity of all of us. Now, there is a, another connection in Leviticus. It speaks of what will happen if the Jewish people or the children of Israel, they turn away from God. What's going to happen? Even in the book of Leviticus, it says, Leviticus 26, it says they will be scattered to the ends of the earth. They will be taken captive. They will live in exile in foreign lands. Leviticus 26, verse 39. Those who are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity, iniquity, in your enemy's land. They will be scattered in the nations for their iniquity. In Leviticus 26, 41, it says the land shall enjoy her Sabbaths while desolate, and they shall accept their punishment for their iniquity. And again, it's the same word, avon. So what it's saying is the Jewish people, if they turn away from God, or the children of Israel, they'll be taken away from the land because of their avon. This is a special word of iniquity. Well, the word avon reappears again in Isaiah 53. That's the avon is what the suffering servant takes away. He takes away the avon, the iniquity. Now, if you put it together, he's bearing their punishment. It says, the punishment for our peace fell upon him. And yet, according to the law of the sacrifice, I mean, you say, wait a minute, if he took the punishment, why should the Jewish people bear the punishments of Leviticus or of the Torah? For 2,000 years, they've been wandering the earth. What is said in the Torah has happened. So according to the sacrificial system or law, if you don't partake in the sacrifice, it does not affect you. If a sacrifice dies for your sins, but you don't partake in that, it's as if it didn't die for your sins. It has no effect. So it took your punishment, but it does you no good because you're going to take your own punishment. I mean, that's true in every way. If the sacrifice takes away the punishment of your iniquity, but you don't take any part in it, then you bear your own punishment. Leviticus says that if you profane the sacrifice, you will bear your own iniquity. So what happens? Messiah dies, and this is deep, and I want you to focus. Messiah dies as the sacrifice to bear the punishment of iniquity. And that's for everybody, but it starts with Israel. But it's everybody, but Israel, it even manifests itself in this world. If Israel as a nation, of course, many Jewish people accepted Messiah, but as a nation, if it as a nation rejects the sacrifice, what's going to happen to Israel? It's going to bear its own iniquity. It'll bear what he bore, in a sense. So what happens? Within 40 years of the sacrifice of Messiah, during which time Israel turns away, by and large, the nation of Israel is taken from the land, is scattered to the nations in exile, an exile that lasts for 2,000 years at least. You know, they say, you know, sometimes speaking to Orthodox Jews, say, you know, 
In 586 B.C., the Jewish people were sent into exile because they were worshiping Baal. They were offering up their children in sacrifices. They were doing horrible things. They were taken away for 70 years in Babylon. So what was it that happened 2,000 years ago that has led the, the children of Israel to be taken away from the land, not for 70 years, but for 2,000 years? Not to one land, but to every land. It had to be something bigger that happened in the first century. What this is saying, it's a mystical thing, and it's a, but a very deep thing, that what the Jewish people have gone through, Messiah died for it already. But if you don't accept it, if you don't take part in it, you'll bear your own. And so what it means is, in a sense, the Jewish people, even in, in being sent into the nations, they are still joined to Messiah in a strange way. Because, in a sense... There's a, there's a similarity between his suffering and their suffering. You know, Paul said that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But he says also judgment comes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. You know that? One rabbi even wrote in the Middle Ages, he wrote this, listen. He said, since the Messiah, listen, this is a rabbi, regular Jewish rabbi. Since the Messiah bears our iniquities which produces the effect of his being bruised, it follows that who will not admit that Messiah suffers for our iniquities must endure and suffer them for himself. One of the most famous Jewish artists of modern times, Marc Chagall, painted a painting called The Crucifixion. He actually did a few versions of it, in which he depicts Jewish suffering for the last 2,000 years. In the center of the picture is a Jewish rabbi with the Hebrew words over it saying, Yeshua. Suffering as he dies in the crucifixion. And what he's saying is, the sufferings of the Jewish people and the sufferings of this Jewish rabbi are joined together in some way. So it's a miserable thing. You look at it for 2,000 years. What happened with Messiah? He was stripped of his possessions. What happened to the Jewish people for 2,000 years? They've been stripped of their possessions. He was judged falsely. They've been judged falsely. They put their sins on, on, they projected falsely sins on Messiah. What happened to the Jewish people? The nations have, have accused them of sin that has nothing to do with them. They become the scapegoats. They were led, as he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, they have been led. Do you see it? They were even, you know, you have the Holocaust, it's like a crucifixion of a nation. And then you have a resurrection of a nation. We're not going to go more, but it is so deep and so real. And what it's saying, the Jewish people are assigned for everybody. Because the sacrifice dies for your sins, for judgment. But the thing is to let him bear it for you. The thing is to join that. Otherwise, we are left on our own. Now, there's a word, another word in Hebrew. And I told you it's going to be deep. There's a word in Hebrew called nazah. Try it. Nazah for, appears in Exodus. In Exodus 29, first time 21, it says, You shall take the blood on the altar... And of the anointing oil, and you shall nazah it on Aaron, his garments, and on his sons. You'll nazah it. What does that mean? Nazah means sprinkle. And then the word appears in Leviticus. Leviticus 4, verse 6. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood, and he shall nazah it seven times. He'll sprinkle it in front of the veil. And again, Leviticus 4.17, again Leviticus 5.9, he will sprinkle Nazah, the blood of the sin offering, on the altar. And again, the priest shall dip, the priest shall sprinkle, the blood is sprinkled. When the leper is cleansed, it's a special ceremony. And, and it's a ceremony involving this bird and another bird and the bird that dies and its blood is mixed with running water and the other blood is baptized in the first one. And, and the blood is sprinkled on the leper and the leper becomes cleansed. The Levites were called to be separated from the rest of Israel. They were the ministers of Israel. How did they become separated? In Numbers 8 it says, take the Levites from the children of Israel, cleanse them, and then nazah them, sprinkle them, purify them. There's the word, nazah comes up with a law of, remember the law of the red heifer, which again is about is being cleansed from, from death, from defilement of death. A clean person would be sprinkled and would be cleansed by being sprinkled. And then comes really the most central moment of nazah, which is Yom Kippur. 
Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, it says the priest takes the blood, and what does he do? He nazaz it on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. That's nazah. He sprinkles it. The high priest, and that's when the sins are forgiven. Now we go back to Isaiah 53 and this mystery of this person who's going to come. But actually go back one chapter before. It's all the same prophecy. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be very high and lifted up. Just as many were astonished at you, his appearance was marred before more than that of man and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall nazah. He shall sprinkle many nations. Whoa. What is this? What is he sprinkling? It doesn't give any explanation. Nothing. What is this about? It's nazah. Same word. In Leviticus. Same word. In the sacrifice. Same word. He will sprinkle. He will sprinkle. It has to do with Leviticus originally. It has to do with cleansing. It has to do with people becoming priests. Like they, but now it's Messiah doing it. It has to do with the sacrifices, because he is the sacrifice. But here he's not just sprinkling an altar, he's sprinkling the nations. He's not just sprinkling one thing. I mean, can imagine, how do you sprinkle the nations? That's, how, that's what he's doing. What does it mean? He, Messiah, shall sprinkle many nations with what? The only thing that, that was really nazah, the main thing was blood, with his own blood. It's done before the veil of the sanctuary. So he's the one who opens up the veil and gives entrance for people to enter into the veil by his blood. He shall sprinkle. The Nazar was the, the offer, the blood of the sin offering. He shall sprinkle many nations that he cleanses them of sin. What does it mean? It's also linked to the healing of the leper or the cleansing of the leper. What's it saying? Who are the lepers? They're the outcasts. They're the ones who are rejected by everybody else. They're the cut-off ones. They're the ones who are sick and not whole. But what it's saying in Messiah, he will sprinkle the lepers of many nations. He will sprinkle the one who is outcast and rejected and bring them inside. And those who were rejected are now accepted. And those who were unclean become clean. And those who were broken become whole by the sprinkling of many nations. What else is that? Naza, that sprinkling. What is it? It's the thing that led the people into their calling. The Levites, the priests, became priests and Levites. So by the sprinkling of Messiah, we become priests of God. You become a priest of God. It's the power, because what it did is, it separated you from everything else. It's the blood of Messiah that separates you from your past, from your sins, from your uncleanness, and makes you worthy to become a priest of God, to be separated. And what is it also about? The sprinkling, the nazar happened with that red heifer. It's about being cleansed from the power of death. He will sprinkle many nations, and many shall be set free from the power of death, of sin and death. They shall be victorious. And what else was that Nazar? On that, it was the holiest moment of the, the entire Bible, the Omega moment, that the sprinkling on Yom Kippur on the Ark of the Covenant means Messiah's death is the ultimate Yom Kippur. It's not just for one people. It's not just for one place. It's for all people. He shall sprinkle many nations. And that, that Yom Kippur blessing, that's what opens up the veil. That's what opens up the entrance. That's the heart. That's the power of every breakthrough, through, of every obstacle from God. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Now, we just looked at just a few Hebrew words. And we just looked at Isaiah 53. There's a whole other thing we'll do another time, but, but we're going to just kind of bring this together now. But this is what's there. God is so perfect that he has all these things. I mean, that's what you'd expect. If Isaiah 53 is about the sacrifice of Messiah, it should be somehow linked to the sacrifices of Israel. It's all there in the Hebrew. But we see Leviticus all over it. Why? See, God gave Israel the law to show them their sin. And then he gave the answer, the sacrifices, which were foreshadows of Messiah coming. It's all pointing. And then all of a sudden he brings up, then comes Isaiah 53 saying, wait a minute. You've had all these, you've had all these goats and lambs and birds and calves. And all, but now we're going to show you what the sacrifice really is. 
These were all just shadows of what the real thing is. And the real thing is him. It's not about animals. It's about him. Who do we see? We see him. What is Isaiah 53 about? It's about everything Leviticus is about. It's about, number one, dealing with sin. How? By doing away with sin. By placing it on an innocent sin-bearer, Messiah, who is led silently to the slaughter, just like the sacrifices were. So the Lord has laid upon him the sacrifice. It's about the sacrifice that bears the sin, and he's bearing the sin. It's what happens with the sacrifice? The sacrifice becomes one with the sin, so that's what you're seeing in Messiah. He's becoming one. He's identifying with the sin. He becomes sin. And then it says, the punishment came upon him, and he made intercession for the transgression. He becomes priestly. And the blood is sprinkled, applied. This is all so awesomely perfect from God. What does it reveal to us? Beyond everything else, it reveals this. There are two parts in the sacrifice. And the first part is that the sacrifice is identified with the sin. The second part is that the one who is going to be touched by that sacrifice has to identify with the sacrifice. If you have only one part, if a sacrifice, as we said, died for your sins, and you don't take part in it, it doesn't do you any good. And in order to take part in it, you have to become one with the sacrifice. And that's the mystery of salvation. The first mystery is what Jesus did, what Yeshua Messiah did. And that is that he becomes one with every sin we have ever sinned, every sin in our life. He becomes one. He takes it upon himself. That awesome. He became sin for us. He takes everything. He didn't just become one with sin. He became one with you, every sinner, no matter who you are. It wasn't just sin. It was your sin particularly. So he becomes one with it. He does that with every sin. But that's only the first part. That's the whole thing of, of salvation on his part. But it doesn't do us any good unless we are identifying with him and taking part in him. And in order to take part in that, you have to become one with the one who bore your sin. That's why Paul could say, it's not I who live, it's him. We're one. I, my old life is dead. I'm in him now. I'm in him. He became one with us, but now it's complete when we become one with him. And that's when the power comes. Think about it. When you get saved, that's what you're doing. You're saying, Jesus, you didn't just die for sin. You died for my sin. 2,000 years ago, he died for your sin. But when, when you accept it, it becomes one. That's it. That's when salvation comes. You say, Lord, that was me on the cross. That was me. And so that, that's when salvation comes. But the key is that's not just salvation coming. That's when the power to live with all the blessings of salvation come the more you become one with Him. The more you partake of it, the more the power becomes one for your life. That's the key. It's not just He died and He died, but it's specifically my sin. And not only that, Lord, I'm not separate from you anymore. I'm one with you. You identified with me, and now I'm identifying with you. And you took my sin, now I am one with your life. I am taking your righteousness. I am joining together because I'm one with you. You took all those things, I'm taking your reproach. I am receiving everything that you had, I'm going to be one with you. I'm going to care more about your reputation than my reputation. Because your reputation is my reputation. Your life is my life. Your righteousness is mine. So when I mess up, I can say, Lord, by the blood of Messiah, your righteousness is mine. By the blood of Messiah, your victory is mine. By the blood of Messiah, your breakthrough is mine. By the blood of Messiah, your power is mine. Your what is yours is mine. And so that everything that is mine is yours, and whatever is yours is mine. Lord, I give you everything. I give you my sins. I give you my shame. I give you my everything, so I'm not separate from you anymore. And everything that is yours, it is mine. That's the key. We are not just with him, we're in him. We are one with him. That's the majesty of salvation. We are one. And the key in salvation, don't live your life just next to him. And don't live your life like, you know, he's up there. and I'm Yeah, he's up there in one sense. But the older thing, he's got to be right here. And it's not just I have him in my life. It's me and him. We are as one. And that everything you do, do it with him. Everything you do, it's in Him. You're not just living with Him. You're living His life. When you talk, you want it to be Him talking. When you're bearing something, let Him bear it. Let Him take it away. 
Whatever's separating you from each other, Lord, I don't want to be separate. We shall be one. You did everything that you did so there'd be no separation. So here is the the incredible thing, and it's the secret of salvation, if you will, and that is that we are to live. It says the two shall be one. Whatever you do, even when you pray to him, pray in him. Let it be him praying with you. He prays with us. Look at what he did. He's on the cross as us, and he's on the cross as you and me. And he's on the cross, and he's crying out to God, and he's saying, why have you forsaken me? And he's saying, well, how, some people say, well, how could he be God? Well, that's the incredibleness of it. Because what it means is that when you cry out and say, God, why are you far from me? He's with you crying out the same thing. And if he's with you crying out, then you're not far from God. So even that can't separate you from the love of God. What shall separate you from the love of God? Shall sin, shall trouble, shall whatever you've done? No, he took it all. That's the incredibleness of God. He took it all. So even all those things, I mean, how can God take sin? But he did. So that even in sin, even in rebellion, about you cannot be separated. He's taken it. But you've got to take part of that and take it to yourself. So that whatever you do, the key is, if he did all that to become one with you, then the least we can do is live our lives one with him. And so that means get into the joy of living in him, by him, through him. That whatever you do, talk in his talking, move in his moving, touch in his touching, love in his loving, live in his life, feel in his feeling, think in his thoughts, be one with him because he was one with you. That is the joy, that is the power, because all those things, like the promises of the sacrifice, every promise, the peace the, the breakthrough, the 